morning. Good morning. Good morning. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there to Isaiah 53. I'm charged with verses 5 and 6 this morning. Let me read them. We've already heard Brother David read it. We're going to read it again. Isaiah 53 and verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Would you pray with me? <coughs> Father in heaven, how would be your name this morning? We desire to see your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we delight to be gathered together in your house this morning. We're here by the multitude of your mercies. And Lord, we desire to hear and to see Jesus Christ high and lifted up, that he might have the preeminence. We might be humbled. We might come anew and afresh unto him. Lord, give an outpouring of your Holy Spirit. We pray for unction, both in the pulpit and the pew. Lord, that you would be pleased to meet with us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we've already heard uh, several times, if, if we only had one Old Testament, if we only had the Old Testament, if we only had one Old Testament passage and <laughs> wanted to show you Jesus Christ in it, there is no other passage, there is no other prophecy that so clearly portrays that so clearly foretells, that so clearly foreshadows the sufferings of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. His suffering, his substitution, and God's satisfaction in that, all so clearly prophesied in this wonderful chapter. So as we continue on in this prophecy, we read the words of those who initially, as we said last night, these initially did not believe. If you glance at verse 2, he hath no form nor coming. It's no beauty that we should desire him. That's where they were. Verse 3, we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him, it says not, we esteemed him as a nobody, mm, as right. nothing. Right, yeah. mm. Meant nothing to us was not even on the radar of verse 4 even though there was much in him that they should have realized yet we esteemed him stricken smitten of God and afflicted but now now the arm of the Lord has been revealed to them now they do believe and they are explaining what they now see in this suffering servant so verse 5 begins a contrast to what was seen and said of him before and what we see here in these verses is simply the testimony of those who now can see. They see the Messiah. They're explaining that they once had no regard. They once had no use for Christ. They esteemed him not. They looked at him as worthless. In other words, they're saying, we saw him suffering and we thought he must be suffering for some great sins. <laughs> we esteemed him stricken smitten of God, afflicted, that God was punishing him for some unknown sins to us. But then verse 5, he says, but. Do you see a change here? But. Here's a change of mind. Here's a change of perspective. Here's a change of heart concerning this suffering one. Here is what we call gospel repentance. Yes. Now we look at him differently. Now we look upon his sufferings in a new and in a whole different light. Now his sufferings are looked upon as from another perspective, a whole different point of view. Notice, first of all, that they speak of the violent nature of his sufferings. 
the violent nature of his suffering. He was wounded for our transgressions. This is their confession. This is their repentance. He was wounded for our transgressions. If we hear someone, if we hear someone getting wounded, we don't get too disturbed. But I want you to know the word wounded here in the Hebrew is a word that literally means fatally wounded. It wasn't a scratch. It wasn't just a little hurt. He was fatally wounded. This word, again, means to be violently wounded as if to be pierced through, like on a battlefield, fatally wounded on a battlefield. An obvious reference to these soldiers piercing his hands, piercing his feet, piercing his side. If you have a marginal rendering, you'll see it renders it tormented or tortured. Yes. He was tormented or tortured. But we must understand that torment <coughs> and that torturing as unto death. Unto death. The same is said of Saul in 1 Samuel 31 3. The battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him, and he was wounded of the archers. Now we know Saul fell on his sword, but what we're seeing here is that wound was ultimately fatal for him, and he knew it was fatal. And so the Lord Jesus Christ, what this says, he was wounded for our transgression. He was mortally wounded for our transgressions. Mm -hmm. And then he was bruised for our iniquities. This word means to be literally broken into pieces, literally to be crushed to pieces for our iniquities. The weight of God's judgment that was upon Christ was of a bruising, a crushing nature. <clears throat> Take just a moment and turn over to Psalm 22. A clear messianic psalm of our Lord. I won't take time to read all of it, but just look at verse 12 through verse 16. By the way, this, this Psalm 22, I believe, is the, uh, the introspection, the inward voice of the Lord Jesus Christ as he suffers on the cross. And this was written about a thousand years before the cross. And yet David, as a prophet, describes in great detail the sufferings of our Lord. Look at verse 12. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Again, we see how he was wounded, fatally pierced through for our transgressions. He was bruised. He was crushed for our iniquities. And not only are these sufferings described, brethren, as violent, and we need to see them as violent, but they are also described here as vicarious. And this is a word we've heard already in these sermons, vicarious. Now, the Roman Catholics and even the Pope himself would call him the call himself the <coughs> himself the vicar yes. of Christ. Hmm. Now that's of course heretical. Yes. Right. But what he is saying is, I am the representative of Christ on earth. When you see me, you treat me and you see me as God. Who would call themselves Holy Father or allow themselves to be called That's Holy Father? Right. But I say all that for us to understand better what this word vicarious means. It's one substituting himself for another. And these sufferings of Christ were vicarious. Vicarious substitutionary sufferings. And notice here in our text that these people who are speaking are saying, now we're seeing his sufferings in a different light. Not that we were totally wrong before. You see, before we thought his suffering was for great, great, and yet unknown sins. And now we see that sure enough it was. We thought it was God's judgment that was upon him, and sure enough it was. But what we didn't see before that we now see was that it was for our sin. 
for which he was wounded. It was for our sin that he was bruised. The crushing weight of judgment that fell upon the Lord Jesus Christ was for our transgressions. It was for our iniquities. It was my sin that put him there on the cross. Amen. Brethren, in a nutshell, this is salvation. Mm. This has got to happen in your life. There's a time when every lost sinner, they pay no attention to Christ. They do not see Christ for who he is and what he's done. They care nothing for him. He is a no matter in their life. And when God grants a person repentance, they come to see that it was my sin that he bore on that cross. Amen. He was Amen. bruised for my iniquities. He was wounded for my transgressions. Unless you've never seen that, that it was for you. You see him suffering. It was for you. If you've never seen that, you're not saved. I'm right. sorry, you're not saved. Right. Right. You have to see the vicarious nature of the sufferings of Christ. Amen. And so what is introduced in these verses, we know is opened up much more clearly in the New Testament as the doctrine, of course, of substitutionary atonement. Amen. It's absolutely essential that Christ fulfill Old Testament prophecy, that he will fulfills everything that was said about him. Think of these words of Jesus. He said the same about himself. He says in Matthew 26, all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. He says in Luke, all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me, Luke 24, 44. So Jesus himself said, every word of this prophecy must be fulfilled about me. And we spoke of this last night. Christ was rejected by the Jewish people. He came unto his own, yeah. and his own received him not. That seems like a terrible thing for Christianity, doesn't it? Seems like an insurmountable mountain for Christianity to overcome. How many missionaries going out into the Gentile world trying to convince people that Jesus is the promised Jewish Messiah when his own people, the Jews, the people who were best prepared to recognize him and to accept him and receive him, they said... No, he's not the Messiah. How can we expect Gentiles to believe on him? They've never seen him. They've never been taught to recognize him as the Jewish people were. At first, this might seem like an insurmountable hindrance to the spread of Christianity, except for this one little minor thing. The prophets and all the prophecies that he would be rejected by his own people. That had to be. Had he been received readily by the bulk of Jewry, he would not have been the Messiah. He could not have been the Messiah. He had to be rejected right. to be the Messiah. Right. If a Messiah comes along and all Israel believes on him, you can be sure he's not the one. <laughs> if Jesus had not been rejected by his own people, he could not have been the Messiah. That's right. And as we said last night, when he says, who had believed our report, not everybody rejected him. Some received him, but mostly all did. So Isaiah is clearly pointing out here in our text today in verse 5 that the Messiah is the one who will suffer. A suffering Messiah. A stumbling block, of course, to the Jews. Foolishness to the Greeks. We know many of God's people have suffered. We've all suffered to some degree, many more than others. But what's unique about this one is that he is not suffering for his own sin. He is suffering not for his own folly. He's not even suffering accidentally, but he is suffering according to the will of God for the sins of the people. Amen. Amen. Christ did not sin. We need to set that forth clearly. He was holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. He Amen. did not sin ever, Amen. ever. Christ could not sin. That's right. That's right. He was impeccable. It Amen. was impossible Amen. that he would sin. He was immutable. Yeah. He never changed. This is the way he was. This is the way he's always been. The eternal Son of God come and made manifest in the flesh. But he suffered and died. Right? Amen. Mm. Why? 
you have to settle this in your heart. Why did, if he were wholly harmless, undefiled, he couldn't sin, he didn't sin, and yet the wages of sin is death and he died, why did he die? Substitutionary atonement. The vicarious nature of the atonement. He died bearing someone else's sins. If you're a believer, your sins were imputed unto the Lord Jesus Christ. He bore your sins in his own body. Amen on that tree. He died for the sins of his people. Do you realize there are people today who profess to be Christians that reject this whole idea of substitutionary atonement? Mm, that's right. Mm. They call it cosmic child abuse. Yet when we look at the New Testament, it is clearly taught over and over that Christ died for his people. He died for the sins of his people. Paul says in Romans 4.25, he was delivered, not for his offenses, he was delivered for our offenses. And he was raised again for our justification. Paul, that great passage as he opens up 1 Corinthians 15, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which you also received, wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. Here it comes. I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins. Right. But he doesn't stop there. He says, according to the scriptures. The end. Uh, he didn't have a New Testament when he said that. <laughs> I wonder what scripture he's talking about. The Old Testament. Amen. Especially Amen. Isaiah 53. He died for our sins, according to these scriptures we're preaching right now. Amen. In this context. Peter says in 1 Peter 2.24 of Christ who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Every New Testament writer attests to the type of suffering and death that Isaiah is depicting here in our text today. That's the, that is the kind of death that Jesus Christ fulfilled in the New Testament. So his sufferings were violent, his sufferings were vicarious, and his sufferings, brethren, were victorious. Yes, amen. They were victorious. Isaiah is not prophesying of a Messiah who goes to a cross and just does his level best to save his people. Hmm. That's not the Christ of the Bible. Amen. Notice the phrase there in verse 5, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. Literally, this says the chastisement needed, the chastisement required for our peace that brought about our peace with God, it was upon him, upon Christ. In other words, not that Christ went to the cross and he was going to do what he could to try to make peace between you and God, and then when you come along, you've got to do the rest. He's done all he can do. You have to do your part. And brethren, if that was the case, then you might as well see dead men jumping out of the bottom of a river. <laughs> Because that's what we were. Dead in trespassing sins. What can a dead man do but be dead? <laughs> that's all you can do is be dead. He must hear the voice of the Son of God and then he will live. What Isaiah is saying here is that the things that happened to him, to Christ, the judgment that fell upon him, the end of all of that was that it brought peace to us. You think you can make peace with God? I can't tell you how many people I ask. How are things, you know, some of you may or may not know, for 36 years I was a dentist, and I had a captive audience. I would work on their teeth, and I would talk to them about life. I'd talk to them about God. I'd talk to them about the gospel. And I can't tell you how many people in all those years I would ask them, how are things with you and the Lord? Well, me and God, we're, we're good. You know, everything's good. What they're saying is, I'm at peace with God, and he's at peace with me. And they care nothing for the Lord Jesus Christ. They know nothing of the gospel. That's right. Amen. Brethren, God has to bring peace, and he brought peace because the chastisement necessary to make peace between you and God, Christ did it all. Amen. He accomplished Amen. it all. He wasn't trying to do it. He did it. Amen. He doesn't try to do anything. That's right. If God's trying to do anything, he's not God. That's right. Is the one that's got all the power and all the authority and all the knowledge. Yeah. He does what he wants to do. Our God's in the heaven. He does whatever he pleases. Right. Amen. And this is what pleased God. 
He says the same thing in the next phrase, and with his stripes were you healed. I'm going to do my level best not to go and chase rabbits here. But <laughs> his stripes were not medicine to put on our wounds. His stripes were that which did away with our wounds. In fact, Peter quotes this. We started quoting it just a few minutes ago in 1 Peter 2.24, but I want to quote the rest of it. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. <coughs> Past tense. Right. You were yeah, healed. Right. Now, people want to run here and say, oh, we're talking about physical infirmities, if you just have enough faith, you'll be healed of this and you'll be healed of that. Do you, did you hear what that verse says? We being dead to sins would live unto righteousness by whose stripes we're healed. Healed of what? Healed of sin. sin. Amen. Yes. Amen. Who cares if we're healed of bodily afflictions and then we turn around and die and go to the grave? Amen. I want to be healed of my sins. Amen. I want my sins forgiven. Amen. You talk about healing, that's healing. Amen. Amen. And this is not some attempt to heal us up. This is not just medicine that somehow you're going to have to take it and then apply it to your own wounds. The stripes of the Lord Jesus, those stripes are effectual and they heal and they secure that healing. And that's why, that's one reason why, brethren, we must believe in a limited particular yes. redemption. Right. Right. He wasn't trying to do anything. He accomplished what God purposed for Amen. him to do. Now we're not arguing over how many did Christ die for. We are contending for the nature of his death. Did his death really accomplish anything? If his stripes heal those for whom he died, then the only ones for whom he died are the ones who get healed, right? Amen. And again, we're not just talking about Look, there is an aspect that all your physical infirmities are going to be healed one day. Amen. But if you're looking for that in this life, you're going to be sadly disappointed. Yes. Right. But one day, everything that hinders us from running full speed and <laughs> honor and adoration and worship and love to our God, all of that's going to be taken away. We're going to have resurrected bodies. And try that. And we're going to be able to do what our heart desires. Does it really matter whether Jesus was born in Bethlehem or in Nazareth? Does that really matter? I see some heads going this way. It's such a minor thing, isn't it? I mean, both were insignificant towns, really. Does it really matter? Well, obviously, yes, it does. Yes. Because the prophet said That's right. Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. Not in Nazareth. That's right, right. And if he's not born in Bethlehem, he is not the Messiah. That's right. Case closed. End of story. Isaiah here says he would die a death, not that he would just potentially do something, but a death that would actually heal and a death that would actually bring about peace between God and a man, between God and a woman between God and a boy or a girl. And any atonement that does less than that is not the atonement that Isaiah is speaking about here. Isaiah testifies that Christ was fatally wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement that brought about our peace with God was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And again, this healing is not some temporary bodily healing, yet eventually it will be. This healing is from the eternal effects of your sin. And that's the best healing. Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures, and in his death we have life. Isn't that so strange and paradoxical? Christianity teaches that life comes out of death. <laughs> The worldly mindset is that you live and then you die. No, you die and then you live. <laughs> Christ died and we live. He died and he lived. A 
think Brother Doug quoted last night. There Jesus talking to Lazarus' sister. And he says, I'm the resurrection of life. Mm -hmm. He that believeth, even though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that lives and believes in me, you're not ever going to die. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that? Mm -hmm. I do. Amen. I do. Jesus died for our sins, and in him we have life. If he was wounded for everybody's transgressions, if he was bruised for everybody's iniquities, if the chastisement of everybody's peace was upon him, and by his stripes everybody is healed of their deadly disease of sin, then if everybody is not saved, then it seems like he suffered and died in vain. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Right? Yes. But this says he's, his sufferings were victorious. They actually accomplished what they came to do. Well, let's leave verse 5. We could go on and on there. Let's look at verse 6. Verse 6, Isaiah here gives us a beautiful illustration of the doctrine that he has just been teaching. There are many terms for this thing called sin. We call it sin, of course. That word means to miss the mark. It's as if you had a bow and arrow and you're shooting at a target and you let her fly, and you don't know where it hit, but it didn't hit that target. You missed the mark. That's one term for sin. Missing the mark. God's law and God's glorious perfection and love is the standard, and all have sinned and come short of that mark, of the glory of God. Another word for sin is iniquity. Iniquity is literally lawlessness. Lawlessness. Another word for sin is transgress or trespass. There are many terms that are used to describe sin, but here in verse 6, we find an illustration of the word that was used in verse 5. Verse 5 says he was wounded, he was pierced, he was run through for our transgressions. To transgress is to step over a boundary. It's to trespass. Here's the boundary that God has drawn around us. It is his book. It is his law. It is his commandments. He says, don't step over this line. Don't do it. The day you do it, what's going to happen? You shall surely die. Yes. You miss the mark. You don't hit the bullseye directly every time with the right motive. It's over for you. And this is what it means to transgress, to break out of the bounds that God himself has put around us. And that is what is being illustrated here in verse 6. Look at verse 6 with me. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let's talk about sheep for a minute. We're sheep. Yes. If you're a Christian, yes. you're sheep. Sheep are apt to go astray without shepherd. They do certain things as a group. Sheep do. And one of those things they do as a group is they go astray. They aren't real smart. Now don't get your feelings hurt. I'm just telling you the truth. Yes. We're sheep and we're not real smart. Myself and they are either apt to be driven out of the fold if the wolf shows up or the predator comes around and scatters them, or they will wander off on their own. They're not real smart. This pictures all of humanity. This lumps us all together. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And as Paul says in Romans 3.12, they are all gone out of the way. Not one of them is seeking after. We are all born with a sin nature. I hope you know that. David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. And as soon as we were able, brethren, we went forth from our mother's womb telling lies, yes. speaking lies. As soon as every human being has an opportunity, they will begin to sin. You say, oh, my little child is so sweet and so innocent. No, they're not. <laughs> If they were your size, they would kill you. That's the reality. 
And this is what Isaiah is saying here. All we like sheep have gone astray. As a group, we all got out. We all departed from our shepherd's care. We all rebelled. We all have that old sinful nature. We all have that old self-will. We want my way and not God's way. Mm -hmm. We don't want the constraints that God has established around us. We want to break out and we want to go. And we all, in reality, we broke out as a flock. We all, as the scripture says, we all went astray like sheep. But once gone astray, it gets worse, brethren. Then each of us turn every one his own way. The wickedness I pursued is not necessarily the wickedness that you pursued as a lost person. We all have our own individual developments of wickedness. Some people go down this path to destruction. Other people go down this path to destruction. Wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Mm -hmm. You need to know there are many ways to hell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have very creative ways to sin. Mm -hmm. So this is the figure of speech that Isaiah is setting before us. That's what we've done. The sheep have, that have gone astray, the sheep that have each turned to his own way, are absolutely unmindful of the great danger that's out there. They're dumb. They're stupid. They don't understand that there's a reason that they're supposed to stay in the pasture. All they know is, I want out. I can remember a time, I wouldn't have said it that way, but by my actions, that's what I was doing. That's how I was living. It's very common among young people, as you get a little older and mom and daddy let the string out a little bit more, <laughs> you want out. You want to go your own way. You want to do your own thing. You're smart. You know all you need to know. Let me tell you, there is danger out there. Yeah. You're going to be under someone's authority. You better constantly submit yourself under the proper authority. Right. Your parents, ultimately, mm -hmm. God himself, the church. You go your own way, there's a lot of ways to hell out there. So this is the figure of speech that Isaiah is setting forth. That's the nature of our sin. We want to go our own way, and it is not God's way. And as sheep gone astray, men are unmindful of the danger and the consequences of that action. Transgression, trespassing, going astray, turning our own way. You see, this is sin, and this is iniquity. But blessed be God. Hmm. What a contrast between what we did and what the Lord God has done. The Lord hath laid on him. He hath laid on the Messiah. He hath laid on the sinless one, the one who never went astray, the one who came to do his Father's will. He hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And again, this is the testimony of all the redeemed, without exception. Mm -hmm. The Lord has laid on him my sin. I can't bear it. I can't pay for it. I can't do anything to recommend myself to God and to establish peace with God. Peace with God. The Lord has laid on him Amen. my iniquity. This is what we did. We went astray. We went our own way. You see, this is their confession. This is their repentance. This is what we did. And this is what God has done. Our iniquity laid on him. All through the Gospel of John, Jesus talks about a people that God had given unto him. You know these verses, John 6, 37. Jesus said, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me. You see, there's a people that the Father has given him. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Verse 39, same chapter. This is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. In John 10, the great shepherd chapter, Jesus identifies these people that God had given him to save. He identifies them as his sheep. Yes. He says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. Amen. You might say, I've heard people say, well, everybody's a sheep. Jesus came to save everyone. 
Not so. That's right. That's right. Yes. That is not true. A little later in John 10, 26, we hear J Jesus saying this to some Jews. He said, you are not of my sheep. Mm -hmm. Now, I've heard this all my Christian life. Well, they're not his sheep because they didn't believe on him. Wait a minute. That's not what Jesus said. Right. Listen to what Jesus said. He said, you're not my sheep. That's why you don't believe because you're not my sheep. Right. That's why you don't believe That's right. because you're not my sheep. If you were my sheep, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Other sheep I have, he said, that are not of this fold. Them also I'm going to bring. Amen. Talking about the Gentiles. That's right. Aren't you glad? That's you and me. Amen. I don't know Amen. if there's any ethnic Jews here. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Other sheep. That's us. That's right. That's right. I like that. I hope you see the picture Isaiah is painting here for us. The sheep have gone astray. Everyone turned to his own way and scattered. The hireling also, he flees. They aren't his sheep. He doesn't care about them. Let them go. I'm not suffering for these sheep. The consequences of their going astray is going to destroy them. The wolves are closing in. But instead of the consequences of their straying falling upon them, the Lord has laid on him. The good shepherd, Jesus the Christ, he has laid on him the iniquity of us all. All his sheep. Mm -hmm. Think about this. His sheep have always been his sheep. That's right. right. Yes. They've always been his and he has always been responsible for them. Amen. Are you a sheep? Right. You've always been his sheep. Yes. From the foundation of the world, whenever that was, eternity passed, we said that's not even a proper way to speak. <laughs> From eternity, you've been his sheep. And he has always been responsible for I challenge you to meditate on that a little bit this week. Mm. That he's been responsible for your ears. <clears throat> Let me give you an example of that. I don't think there's any little bitty kids here, but all you kids were little bitty at one point. <laughs> so you took your little child into an antique store. You and your wife, you're going to look at antiques. And you're walking around, and you got a two-year-old with you. And you know what that two-year-old wants. He wants to run. He wants to go his own way. And you say, well, I'll let him out a little bit. I'll keep my eye on him. Lo and behold, he knocks off a very expensive antique lamp, and he destroys it, shatters it to pieces. And the owner comes to you and says, uh, you know how much that thing costs? And you say, I didn't break it. He did it. Talk to him about it. Do you see my point? That's right. He's yours. He's always been yours. You're responsible for him, and whatever he does, you're responsible to pay for it. And as the sheep of our Lord God, we've always been his. Right. And Amen. when we sin against him, you know what? He's responsible for us. And he yeah. will pay for yeah. it. And he did pay for it. Yes, that's right. He did. We have yeah. always been the special possession of the good shepherd. I love that. I want to meditate on that daily. Yeah. Amen. They can't pray, pay for their breaking out. For their iniquities, but the good shepherd takes responsibility for them. He pays what they owe because they're his. If they can't, he can, and he will. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let's, as we close down here, this word laid or laid on. The Hebrew language is not like the English, English language. When I think of laid, I think of gently put down. This is not the Hebrew word here. It means to meet violently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the best description I can make in my mind, if I see a number of rivers, tributaries, small tributaries, and they're flowing from a mountainside down here, and yet they meet in one river. And this is the idea. Rushing rivers, many rushing rivers, all converging upon one place, all at one time. We often read, this is used also in the Old Testament, kings 
they command a servant to go and fall on that man over there. For those of you who read the authorized, you understand what that means. Go kill him. Go fall on him. That is the Hebrew word here. He had laid on him. He didn't just set it on him. It was violently put upon our Lord Jesus Christ. Our sin, our iniquity was violently put upon him to kill him, to crush him. Remember, King Saul found out that the priest had unknowingly helped David escape. And he told his men to go down there and fall on those priests. In other words, go kill them. Well, his men didn't want to do that. But one man did. His name was Doeg. You remember Doeg? Mm -hmm. Doeg went down there and fell upon those priests and killed them. Mm -hmm. This is the word laid on here in verse 6. It doesn't mean a gentle, placid, calming placing of a thing upon Christ, but the consequences of our iniquity violently fell upon him, leading to death. And it was the Lord, all caps, Jehovah, God, that laid our iniquities on Christ. And Christ willingly submitted himself to the will of his Father. So Christ's sufferings were violent. His sufferings were vicarious. His sufferings were victorious. Yes. And lastly, Amen. his sufferings were voluntary. Amen. The Lord, Jehovah, ordained this way of reconciliation and salvation. And he, Jesus Christ, accepted. Uh, God accepted the sacrifice that Jesus Christ was to make. He was delivered unto death by, remember, the determinant counsel and foreknowledge of God. This was God's will. This was God's purpose. Therefore, the scripture says, the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. One last thing to consider here. The iniquity of us all. Who is this all? From Christ's perspective, as we've read earlier, it's all that the Father had given him. To yes. say. That's the all. Yeah. And you don't know who that is, and I don't either. Therefore, as Brother Doug said, we preach the gospel to everyone. Amen. From our perspective, who is this all? It's all those who believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. All those who come to him in repentance and faith. That's the all. And even those, you don't know who those are. Until they do, and sometimes you still don't know. <laughs> because people make false professions of faith. The Lord knows those that are his. Let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But here's what we do know, brethren. We know there is a sufficiency in the death of Christ to save every sinner in a million worlds, if there were a million worlds. There is a sufficiency there. We don't have to doubt that because of who he is and because of the penalty for sin. The penalty for sin is what? Death. And he died a death. And he was an infinite person. So there is a sufficiency there to save every sinner without exception. But we have to consider what was God's purpose? What was God's intent? It was not to save every person without exception. It was to save his sheep, mm -hmm. those that the Father had given him. But we can say the gospel is a real and serious offer of salvation to all men. We can honestly preach the gospel to everyone because of who Christ is. And because, uh, because of what he's done. There's sufficiency there. I don't know who you are here today if you're, if you're outside of Christ, but I can tell you without exception, if you're outside of Christ, who Christ is and what he's done is sufficient to save you from your sins if you Amen. want him and believe upon him. Amen. 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 Make your calling and election sure. Well, we need to be sure of this thing. There is only one way of salvation. All that are justified are justified by having their sins laid upon him. There's no other way. No other way. No one is excluded except those who exclude themselves. That's it. Be sure of this one thing. There's only one way of salvation. He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In ourselves, we were scattered. In Christ, this is a quote from Calvin, and I like it. In ourselves, we were scattered. In Christ, we are collected together. By nature, we wander headlong into destruction. In Christ, we find the way back.
to the gate of life. Unquote. So the innocent Christ were punished as if he were guilty. That the guilty, and that's you and me, might be rewarded just as if we were innocent. That is amazing grace, folks. That is something we rehearse. That is something we preach. We transgress. We committed the iniquity. He was wounded. And he was bruised for it. We were alienated from God. No peace with him. No peace without him. Praise God. The chastisement that was necessary to bring about peace between you and God was with him. He appeased the wrath of an angry God. We went astray. We went our own way. Jehovah caused our sins to fall upon Christ, even unto death, that we might have eternal. So remember, he, Christ, who him, his own self bare our sins in his own body on that tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. For you were as sheep going astray. But now, by the grace of God, you are returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. This is the gospel according to Isaiah.